it's like what's the definition of mindfulness then i think yeah. is it it's very much um so to keep it really simple um it's about really being kind of present in the moment to what's hap actually happening right now welcome to living well with ms this show comes to you from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, which helps people live a full and healthy life through the Overcoming MS program. We interview a range of experts and people with multiple sclerosis. Please remember all opinions expressed are their own. Help others discover living well with MS. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, Let's meet our guest. Welcome to the latest edition of the Living Well with MS podcast. Joining me on this edition is Yvette Sargud. Yvette is a leadership coach and also an overcoming MS facilitator. So welcome to the podcast, Yvette. Thank you. And just to start off, could you um, introduce yourself a little bit more than I have um, and tell us a bit about your MS journey and overcoming MS journey? Sure, of course. So um, I'm Yvette. Um, I'm a mother of um, three grown up children. Uh, I have a lovely partner called Jurgen, and uh, I guess he's like my number one cheerleader. And uh, we live in Ascot uh, near Windsor in the UK. Um, I love learning. So that's a big thing um, for me. Then you may hear some of that um, throughout the podcast and I really try and stay as active as I possibly can and my kind of latest new thing that I've taken up is adaptive rowing so happy to talk more about that if uh, if that's something uh, kind of worth exploring later on it's certainly a challenge um, as you said I've got my own business and I coach leaders um, in organization and I also teach mindfulness uh, to people living with MS uh, through the charity MS UK. I guess my story with MS is pretty similar to a lot of other people's. I had my first symptoms when I was 23, um, which is, um, you may not believe it, but over 35 years ago, so a long, long um, time ago. And uh, my symptoms at that point were optic neuritis. And I had um, a kind of a series of episodes of optic neuritis over, I guess, about 20 years, 20 years plus. Um, so I managed to avoid um, diagnosis. I think I really sought out, if you like, the more passive neurologists who were very happy to just let things be you know the well let's wait and see what see what happens um and so i was very happy to really put my head in the sand and um pretend that this was you know it comes and it goes and actually it's nothing i really need to worry about so i was quite happy to get on with a global career um family and really just get on get on with my um, my life. So that's when I guess, um, you know, 20 odd years um, later, since my first symptom, I started my journey with overcoming MS because I noticed mm, other things were starting to happen to me. I was getting sort of weakness uh, down my right hand side and my leg, which was collapsing. I was getting drop foot. Uh, my hand and arm were getting a little bit sticky and I thought, hmm, okay, something's going on here. I, I, I knew I had MS. I mean, you know, I was very aware of that, even though I was in um, sweet denial, um, shall we say. Um, and in 2013, 2014, I proactively went, what can I do? What can I find out, out there that's really going to help me take control of this thing? And um, so, um, like many people, uh, did a bit of Googling, found George Jelinek's book, consumed it within a day, cleared out my cupboards within 48 hours and really embraced the um, program I'm an all or nothing person. So it was like, okay, 
I'm full in here. And, um, you know, really, I was super lucky that I was able to join an Overcoming MS workshop in Birmingham a few weeks later and join a retreat in London the same year. So I was very quickly, once I'd stepped into the space, fully on board. You know, over the years, I kind of played this little game of, um, you know, avoiding diagnosis and my I kind of went through a few, few neurologists over this time and they um, they were they were very comfortable um, with that because um, I think, you know, I think all that time ago, you know, the criteria may have been slightly different. I think the drugs were more limited and um, I'm not sure I was up for taking drugs at that point in time because I was able to just live my life normally. And there wasn't the research that there is now really to support early use of DMTs for a kind of more positive um, outcome. So, you know, I was very, I was very happy to do that. But there was also something else. I, I came across very early in my career in corporate life a case of where I saw discrimination against an individual with multiple sclerosis. And I, at that point, was very aware this is what I probably had. Um, and that really stuck with me. And I, you know, so it became a, it came a, this is something I need to hold close because I didn't want to experience any bias in terms of kind of my career progression and opportunities for me. Um, so yeah, that, that was something very significant for me um, that, that very much supported my choice throughout my career in corporate um, not, to, not to disclose and share. I do, I do think things have changed dramatically in the last yeah. five or 10 years in terms, you mentioned DMT, so the, the, yeah. the drugs available are hugely different. The understanding of the medical profession about lifestyle changes is changed dramatically over the last five or 10 years. But also just the legislation as well about discrimination again, you know, because that you know, they can't discriminate against people based on having MS and they, and, yeah. and accessibility as well as got, so, you know, all these things, there's just so much change that's happened. I'm, I feel very grateful that I'm in this time than I'm than like being in the 90s or something would be yeah. dramatically different. So starting my career out was the 90s, and um, mm. you know, having seen some of that discrimination, I couldn't eradicate that. I mean, you know, yes, the laws have changed over the years, and I still hear of people experience dis experiencing discrimination in organisations even though that should not be happening. Um, you know, I think there's still some way to go um, in relation to really, um, you know, that full um, getting rid of that disability kind of uh, exclusion and really creating an environment where um, disabilities are welcomed, um, you know, because we all have such rich experiences to bring to um, to bring to the workplace. You know, we have natural resilience just because that's what we have to bring to our lives yeah. every single day. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, we've got a lot to bring. Um, and so because you were sort of late to diagnosis, you also it took quite a while before you you started the Overcoming MS program. So I mean, is is there a benefit to, again, this might be people who were actually formally diagnosed 20 years ago and have only just come across overcoming MS or, or it might be someone similar to you, but is there a benefit to actually um, joining the Overcoming MS program, even if you've had MS for quite a while? Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really great question, Jeff, and uh, absolutely. So I've been on the program now for um, 10, 11 um, years and I think you know what I experienced even after a few weeks of um, changing my diet radically taking the vitamin D uh, being more uh, kind of disciplined I guess 
um, in relation to my um, exercise and stuff, um, I noticed that I was less fatigued. I've got more energy. Uh, I could really um, do more um, in life. So um, absolutely, I think it's, it's super important to do. And I think, um, you know, for me, uh, the, the whole mindfulness element was something I'd tried many times before, um, not because of my MS, but to deal with kind of the stress in my career and failed dismally. You know, once I really understood, um, you know, the, the science, the evidence base behind practicing mindfulness for people with MS, I was on board and I was on the Headspace app and, um, you know, that was that was a fundamental shift for me, I think, because I'd lived so long in denial with my MS. It was such a fundamental shift in terms of actually moving into a place of acceptance um, and actually starting to give myself a break, you know starting to be a little kinder to myself because I was very critical and harsh with um, all the things that I couldn't do um, in, in life. I believe you did start a disease modifying therapy in 2016. And, and, and just to be clear that overcoming MS is not against disease yeah. modifying therapy. It's actually one of the pillars. It's, it's, you know, take the best advice you can, um, you know, alongside diet and exercise, vitamin D, but I mean, equally disease mod modifying therapies. <clears throat> How did that go? I mean, again, so after having a mm. rest for a while, you, you did go on to a, D a DMT. Um, and I how did. did you find that? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd actually been to see um, a neurologist who said, I know you've been avoiding diagnosis. However, I do think there is a drug that may be helpful for you. And so um, he pointed me in the direction of um, somebody at Charing Cross who could um, support me with that. And um, so I proactively at that point sought a diagnosis. And guess what? I got a diagnosis because I had MS, <laughs> you know, it were like multiple lesions sort of floating around. And, um, and so, um, and, and the drug I started was Tecfidera. So even for that, even though that's for, um, you know, predominantly relaxing, remitting, um, I responded positively to, um, to um, doses of um, steroids, which meant that I still had some activity um, within my body. So there were two ticks to say, actually um that does mean i can take tech Vidura, even though i've had ms for the you know however many um years um but but there's also evidence to show that it can slow down progression as well so you know i'm in that camp of relaxing remitting progression and i think there's a move now to kind of try and move away from these different ms labels um so so that was my experience but it's a bit like a minefield. I mean, it took me six months to actually um, start the drug, um, you know, because it's really scary. I'd been drug free up until that point in my life. So it felt like a real big step to actually start to take a drug that potentially I'd be taking for a, a long, long time. Um, so yeah, it was, it was hard. And I'm actually at another decision point now because um, on an MRI, um, I've just they've just found um, a kind of new. It's called a very tiny lesion, apparently. So I'm not sure how big or small that is, but it's, it's super tiny. That was the, ra the radiographer's kind of description. Um, now, you know, do I kind of up? Do I step up to Ocrevus at this point in time? Or do I stick on Tecfidera because, you know, there could be a case for saying, well, everybody with MS is allowed one kind of tiny new lesion every 10 years. So, you know, I, I don't know. So again, I'm in that process of hmm, what do I do? And but what I notice is I'm not getting as caught up right now with that process as I did first time around. And uh, I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a little bit more settled um, around it. But yeah. 
we often ask um, when people go on to the Overcoming a Miss program what they found hardest to um, to actually adopt, and, and a lot of people say, I mean, I'd say the most common is mindfulness, but you've mentioned uh, mindfulness already. I mean, it was that a problem for you, or did you find other things difficult? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate was the hardest thing for me. And uh, I was talking about that workshop I was able to join a few weeks after I'd um, started the program. And I was feeling very proud and chuffed that I'd kind of made it to, I can't remember, 80 or 90% um, cacao chocolate. And, and, you know, but I thought, I must just check this with the person who was talking about all this stuff on the stage, which was Karen from, um, I think, New Zealand at the time. And, um, and, and I went up and I went, so I'm eating, hey, that's okay, isn't it? And she went, absolutely not. And I was going, what do I do then? Because obviously, um, you know, some of the listeners may or may not know, actually the higher percentage of cacao chocolate actually has higher levels of cacao butter in it, which is really high saturated fat. It's the highest saturated kind of fat part of chocolate, I think. So it was like, an absolute no no but you know yeah all like, of that counts to the percentage doesn't it the it does. when you say 80 percent chocolate it's actually 80 percent cocoa solids i think they call it which is yeah. basically all the fat and everything it's not just the cacao powder so i really thought i'd found a way of like getting away from you know replacing my chocolate buttons with this and it was like no that isn't the case so um but you know i'm very happy now i've got you know with my 100 percent cacao powder um hot chocolates and um uh, you know i make my cacao balls with almonds and dates and it's all good so i'm getting my chocolate fix but just in different ways and the overcoming ms chef's card um, if people haven't come mm. across that before, still in restaurants, the last two restaurants I've been to have gone, I've gone, okay, what can you do? Give this to the chef and he can come back. And what they do is come back with the menu and go, you can have this without, we'll take that out. We can do that. So, um, and again, I think someone at the workshop I joined all those years ago said, you know, if they can't actually make the food you need you're in the wrong restaurant so um you know kind of just really find yeah no i had an amazing thing i had we went for a um it was like a, a sort of end of season ball for a surf lifesaving club that i'm involved with and they and they um they had a buffet mm. and i'd given the chef my card and he'd done me a sort of main course because there wasn't much on the buffet that i could have and then he came out and he said oh the thing is they can keep going back for more and more but I'd already eaten the meal. And then he said, um, he said, but do you want something else? Cause, cause actually there was some vegan stuff that I could have eaten, but everyone else had eaten that already. Cause it was really nice. Um, and he just said, Oh, he said, Oh, I'll, I'll, but no, I, you need something else. I, I'm going to, I'll cook you up something. He just did me this extraordinary meal. And he was just like making some, ama- he basically was showing off his, his sort of, yeah. and I think if they like it, a good chef enjoys it because, Actually, probably get bored of cooking the same things again and again and again. But a sort of challenge of like, oh right, okay, let's try. What yeah, it is. It is. It is a challenge, isn't it, for them? And uh, yeah, so it's great. It's good. So, um, and I, I hear like you that that actually when you joined the program, this this annoys a lot of people that you lost too much weight. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I yeah. would say that if you're on a apart from MS, if you're on a plant based whole food diet, it's actually very good for for weight management as well, and that which yeah, I think most of us have found. So ha, did you, I mean, did you find it a problem and, and have you managed to resolve that and get to a, what you consider a healthy weight? Yeah, I, 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 well, you can be the judge as whether I'm a healthy weight or not. I, 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 I think I am. And uh, yeah, I, so my husband actually um, follows the diet with me and we, we kind of at the beginning, both lost so much weight and we probably didn't have that much to lose anyway and um i we just overcame that by um just eating more um filling our plates full of all the kind of nutritious food that we were eating but it was just really a case of going 
actually we just have to increase our portion sizes now i mean most people are trying to decrease them we were just like having to just eat so much more um but yeah and and, and find the rhythm you know because um to start off with it, it was a bit boring as well because we were trying to kind of cook the same few meals and now we have our full repertoire and hey we're good we we love our food yeah we'd never go back and i think you need it you need a new set of cookbooks don't you you need to yeah, you do. throw you away do. all the old cookbooks but and there are some yeah. fantastic i mean well just to call out one which is which just for a meal i had last night was that ashley madden who is Ashley Madden's a, someone with MS who's following Overcoming MS and has written two cookbooks. Um, but her food is just delicious. And like you say, I mean, I just this pad thai salad that she does, and I just had a massive bowl of it, but it's just so full of different uh, vegetables and, and, and just, yeah, plain healthy food. But you can just eat loads of it because, um, yeah, it's all good for you. What sort of benefits have you found then so from following the, the program for quite a long time now have you had improvements from that so i um I did, you know my i've had ms for a very long time and i think you know my ms is still progressing however i am probably more active now than i have been in decades um i do so much more exercise uh, I think generally I'm stronger. Um, I'm, um, as I think, a lot kinder to myself. So I, you know, I think I said this earlier, give myself a lot more uh, kind of slack. And I think overall, I'm really fulfilled in life. Um, so I have a real rich and varied life. Um, I think, um, being part of the Overcoming MS community um, has really, I've met some fantastic people. I've met some inspiring people. I've made so many new friends. Um, I think it's really equipped me to explore different things. Um, so I've really kind of opened up to new experiences. I'm a bit more kind of brave and courageous than maybe I'd been um, in the past. You know, I started to do a MSc in mindfulness part-time at XT University that I finished in 2020. So actually the whole program has just opened up so many new avenues for me that um, I just wouldn't have got to, I don't think, um, any other way. So, yeah. Um and so you, because it's sort of in the corporate world, you work, so working as a leadership um, coach, um, and, and we mentioned about MS and how that could cause a problem in the workplace. So firstly, I mean, we're both in the UK, so this is going to be different in different parts of the world. But sure. I mean, disclosing to an employer that you have MS, I mean, this is something I think all, all of us probably worried about whether they yeah. did or didn't i i mean and i think it does depend on your employer i, I found it a very positive experience yeah. but i knew my management team were very well and i thought it would be fine and absolutely it was and they were very supportive um but what would you encourage people to do it, it with mm -hmm. so i am MS? no i am no um uh, legal expert um so i so i think that's really important to say um, ha and people have no obligation um, to disclose their diagnosis of MS um, to their employer. However, I think as we talked to earlier, I think if there is any adaptation or accommodation that the organization can make that's really going to help you, um, that could make all the difference. In t I guess from you being a kind of okay at your job to maybe somebody who's really thriving at work and i and i guess this is a space i'm really stepping into now from a different angle because you know somebody who actually you know spent their career um really not sharing um uh you know what what was going on for me i'm very conscious that there is a 
really stark underrepresentations of leaders at the top of the org uh, top of the organisation. So there are very few senior leaders um, with disclosed disabilities. And, um, you know, I, I'm kind of now really working, um, you know, and, and helping organizations think about the impact of this, of not having those kind of role models at the top of organizations that people lower down can go, there's somebody like me at the top of the organization. So having a disability, um, something like MS, you know, um, is, is not going to get in the way of me pr progressing um, in my career. So I'm really supporting um, that kind of drive that there is now through my through my leadership coaching. So that's that's really important uh, for me now within my work. And I, I wrote an article and... actually with a with with a collaborator. So if anybody's interested in that. Maybe we can post that at the bottom if if anybody wants. Yeah, to. we can put links in the we show notes. That. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, as a facilitator for overcoming MS, um, I'm aware that I mean, so I've been on uh, overcoming MS retreats, and so the facilitators have a specialization. So, firstly, um, what um, what sections of the Overcoming MS program um, do you do you lead the sessions in, um, and how have you found becoming a, a facilitator? Yeah, so um, probably no surprise. Uh, my kind of area of specialism is stress management and um, specifically uh, mindfulness. So um, that's that's where I um, contribute um, as a facilitator. Um, so I am a newly qualified um, facilitator and I've done a few things um, to date. So I did a session for all the Overcoming MS volunteers um, last year. Um, I've um, done some sessions on the pathways um, that are kind of around um, introducing the Overcoming MS program to, um, to, get to to people new wanting wanting to do more and I'm really excited um, to be part of the facilitator group doing the new um, global um, let me get the name right I think it's the global on, online retreats so um, so we're piloting actually taking the retreats that have been very much face to face and um taking that into into a virtual world and that as well i mean so it there's practical reasons why it's yeah. a good thing because it's global because yeah. before i th pretty much i think australia and the uk might be yeah i, I don't think there are any so, so if you were in in peru it would be really difficult to get to an over overcoming and retreat and also uh, financially as well so it's so it's much more cost effective um that a lot of this content is online but but it's live as well so it's not just there will be things to take away but there's also live sessions so it's um it's something people can do from home or or join it in a group of people as well um if you've got an internet connection you can so you mentioned mindfulness could you tell us a bit more about mindfulness and and why is mindfulness important for people with MS? It's like, what's the definition of mindfulness? And I think yeah. it's, it's very much, um, so to keep it really simple, um, it's about really being kind of present in the moment to what's hap actually happening right now. So, um, you know, it's really about the awareness that comes in from tuning into ourselves, tuning into our thoughts, feelings, body sensations but but in a bringing a real sort of kind curious light touch attitude to it so you know i think as you know we're human beings yeah but however we spend very limited time actually being and we spend most of our time doing and a lot of the time in our head yeah so um jeff i don't know um i'm sure like most of us, you know, you've probably got examples of where you've been in a beautiful place, you know, sitting by the sea and watching, you know, 
by the ocean or being in a park and maybe you're actually really not present you know you're not feeling the water as your toes are dabbling into the ocean or maybe you're not hearing the buzzing bees around or noticing the trees in the park or the sun on your face you know because actually you're listening to the chatter in your mind you've got carried away by sort of different thoughts that are maybe taking you to not so helpful places worries about what might happen in the future or you know churning over stuff that's happened in the past and that's really kind of mindless stuff that's about when we're having our mind full and what we're trying to do when we're mind full not full but mindful is is really being here really tuning into our experience right now and getting some joy out of that because you know particularly for us with ms that chatter of the mind getting carried away by our thoughts um really just adds another layer of stress onto maybe the challenges that we have in living with such a chronic health condition anyway so so what mindfulness can do, the research really shows the stress buffering effects of uh, mindfulness. So it's shown that actually there can be, um, you know, a perceived reduction in the stress that we experience through practicing repeated and regular mindfulness. And there are kind of various studies, probably now over the last 20, 50, 10, 15 years specifically for people with MS, which show the impact both on the kind of physical and the psychological um, impact of it. So, you know, reduced fatigue, reduced depression and anxiety, maybe improving um, balance. And there's a lovely little study that I think it was about 2014 that showed that actually through mindfulness practice, actually it can um, reduce the number of lesions that appear on an, on an, an MRI scan um, for, for people. Um, and, you know, it can reduce the number of relapses. So, do you know, there's loads of compelling evidence to say, why wouldn't you give this a go? You know, it's... Uh, mm. it's... <laughs> Worst case scenario it might just make you happier. It might just, it might just make you happier. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people practice mindfulness in the world, whether they've got MS, another chronic health condition or not, you know, it can be it can be a great grounding exercise to really be present and actually experience a lot of the joy and pleasant stuff in life that when we're off in our mind, we miss. Yeah. Uh, it can be so and easy. what are some of the misconceptions that people have about meditation and stress reduction? Oof. Well, there are there are quite a, quite a few. I'm just back from a global mindfulness um, conference that was held at Bangor University, and um, John Kabat-Zinn, who I'm sure some of you have heard about, sort of almost like the godfather of secular mindfulness, um, and and he created mindfulness-based stress reduction program um, back in the late 1980s he described mindfulness as relationality yeah and big word i was kind of oh okay what's that mean it's all about connected so it's all about connectedness so i think one of the big misconceptions is that actually if you practice mindfulness and sneak up to some quiet silent place in the house and um, you know sit and meditate can almost be perceived as quite selfish yeah and you're just doing that for you and actually I think you know we know that's not the case but um, you know that connectedness is it's not just about me it's actually about we because actually if we can you know gain greater awareness um, from our from our practice then you know we that can really have an impact on our relationships with others and you know with the broader kind of world at large so it can really shift our how we perceive not only ourselves but how we perceive others and a relationship with them and you know and broader than that so i think that's a biggie um 
I think another misconception is that people think it's all about clearing the mind and it's so not, yeah? It's really about just noticing when the mind has wandered. We're never gonna stop it. And just kind of noticing that and just coming back to whatever anchor we're looking, you know, we're using the breath or the body. And that's where the rewiring of the brain um, kind of happens and that can really um, sort of dampen that stress response for us. So we're not trying to stop the mind wandering um, or getting carried away. We're noticing it hopefully sooner through practice and just coming back. So, you know, relaxation, we don't practice mindfulness necessarily with the goal of re relaxation. That might be a byproduct. But, you know, just raising that, I think that's an important misconception. And um, thank you for that. That's a useful tip. But, and talking of tips, um, there's something we often finish with. Do you have um, any tips for someone who's newly diagnosed to um, to MS or is newly taking on the Overcoming MS program? Um, I think, um, so jump into it. I think, you know, thinking about the um, attitudes around <laughs> mindfulness might be helpful. So, you know, really hold it with a light touch, you know, um, get get curious about ooh, what, what it is that um, is being required of the programme and why that's important. So really getting curious about that. But I think, uh, you know, really bringing a beginner's mind to it. So thinking, you know, actually, if you mess up one day, that's okay. There's always a next day. So just kind of learn and just, again, don't be critical with yourself. You know, this is a, you know, it's a journey. Um, and, you know, some days, you know, it may not go so well, but but just, just kind of think about the intention. What's so important about this that actually you've decided to embark on that journey and really hold that front and centre? Because I think, you know, if you can really focus on that, that will probably help you take the right actions. And is there any final thoughts you'd have um, before we conclude? Yeah, it's got to be a final thought about um, mindfulness. And, you know, if anybody is mm -hmm. really struggling with the mindfulness practice, because I, a lot of people say this is the hardest pillar, the hardest part of the Overcoming MS program to, um, you know, engage with. What can be really helpful is to join a course where you're with other people who are starting out on this journey as well and there can be a lot of support and learning um, from starting um, you know to practice mindfulness um, within a course and um, I think as I said at the beginning I teach mindfulness through MS UK um, and uh, you know myself and Phil Startin who's a senior facilitator with Overcoming MS we both teach um, programs um, through MS UK. So take a look at the website. Maybe we can put the link to the different courses on there um, because, you know, they're, they're the population of people with MS. So, you know, it's also a great place to connect with people who absolutely get it um, and, um, you know, start to engage um, in the practice with others yeah and um with that I'd, just to reiterate we'll we'll add links in the show notes so do check out links to resources sure. and thank you very much for joining us if that's all good thank you thanks jeff thank you for listening to this episode of living well with ms please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast You'll find useful links and bonus information there. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And please rate and review the show to help others find us. This show is made possible by the Overcoming MS community. Our theme music is by Claire and Mab Dean. Our host is Jeff Alex. Our videos are edited by Lorna Greenwood. 
and I'm the producer, Regina Beach. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. We'd love to hear from you. The Living Well with MS podcast is for private, non-commercial use and exists to educate and inspire our community of listeners. We do not offer medical advice. For medical advice, please contact your doctor or other licensed healthcare professional.